Good morning. We are in numbers 34 this morning. I hate this. This video is intended for audiences 13 years of age and up. And those that can act like they are 13 years of age and up. Although the father's word is applicable to everyone, including children, we should raise them up in the way that they should go and they will not depart from it when they are older. So, screw you, YouTube. We are in Numbers 34 this morning. If you are one of those people that hates the way I pronounce or attempt to pronounce Hebrew words, this week is going to be like nails on the chalkboard for you. Sorry. Because there's a lot of Hebrew words coming up in Numbers 34. What we are dealing with here is the inheritance for the 12 tribes of Israel. The physical inheritance of land, the promised land. Uh, contextually, we saw last week in 34, basically the itinerary of where these Hebrew Israelites went, excuse me, went for the 40 years that they wandered the wilderness. And we know that they wandered the wilderness um, as punishment because they rejected the promised land and uh, Yah let them die off. There are two military aged males from the original 603,550 children of Israel, Caleb and Joshua, Yahushua, <coughs> that make it into the promised land. Two. The rest of them have been rolled over. There's still 600,000 some odd men, interestingly. And now they find themselves in uh, Numbers 34, about to inherit the promised land. So we'll pick up there <clears throat> after I have a little bit of coffee. I get many emails each week that are like, Bear, you look tired. You should rest. See, this is the fruit of what I do. Very few people see the planting and the tending and the raising and the pruning and the staking and the fertilizing uh, of what I do. This is my rest. <laughs> Numbers 34. And Yahweh spoke to Moshe, saying, Command the children of Israel, and say to them, When you come into the land of Canaan, this is the land which falls to you as an inheritance, the land of Canaan to its boundaries. Then your southern border shall be from the wilderness of Sin along the border of Edom, the Edomites, and your southern border shall be eastward from the end of the salt sea. Then your border shall turn the southern, from the southern side of the ascent of the Achrabim, continue to sin, and be on the south of the Kadesh Barnea. And it shall go on to Hatsar Adar, and continue to Atzman. And at the border shall turn from Atzman to the Wadi of Mitzrayim. Remember, a Wadi is a dry riverbed, or a mostly dry riverbed. Imagine like a big river with a creek running down the middle of it, and all that land that would or could be occupied by water isn't. That is a wadi. And shall end at the sea. As for the western border, you shall have the great sea for a border. This is your western border. This is your northern border. From the great sea, die fruit fly. Somebody asked in a video recently, he's like, you still have flies there? We're not going to get into grow regions, but yes.
western border, Great Sea is the western border, and for your northern border from the Great Sea, you mark out your border to Mount Hor, and from Mount Hor, you mark out your border to the entrance of Hamath. To the edge of the border shall be Sadad, and the border shall proceed to Zephron, and shall end at Hetzar Anan. This is your northern border, and you shall mark out your eastern border from Hetzar Anan to Shepham, and the border shall go down from Shepham to Ribla on the east side of Ain, and the border shall go down and reach the eastern side of the Sea of Kenareth. And the border shall go down along the Jordan and shall end at the Salt Sea. This is your land with its surrounding boundaries. Now, some things to think about here. That is far larger than um, modern day Israel. So, that's one thing. The next is, ergo, modern-day Israel is not Israel. We are Israel. And the third thing is the very last page, literally the last physical page in the scriptures, the version of the Bible uh, that we tend to use here. It's this map. And so if you have the scriptures... You can just flip to this page. If you don't, this is what we're talking about. And these are the allotments of the tribes. Um, yet another reason that I'm a big fan of the scriptures. But we can see that it's a pretty good sized chunk of land there. It is not just the, uh, what is modern day Israel. And if you think about it, oh, it goes down to Egypt. Well, what was it? Uh, Seven Days War, didn't uh, the nation state of Israel procure the Sinai Peninsula from those dirty Mitzrites during the Seven Days War? <clears throat> but, but I digress. So, there's a considerable chunk of land there. Verse 13, And Moshe commanded the children of Israel, saying, This is the land which you inherit by lot, which Yahweh has commanded to give to the nine tribes and to the half tribe. Because remember, we got two tribes that are east of the Jordan River. We've got Reuben and Gad that are staying there. And because Manasseh, or Manasseh, is <laughs> Manasseh, massive, um, they're going to get split on either side of the Jordan River and the Salt Sea. So, there's two and a half tribes, East Manasseh, Gad, and Reuben on the east side of the Jordan, and there's nine and a half tribes on the west side of the Jordan, and that is done... Um, Intentionally. Remember, we saw, it was the last week, a couple weeks ago, that uh, Reuben and Gad were like, yo, man, this is a good place for sheep. Let us stay here. And Moshe is like, you can stay here as long as all of your military-aged males go with us on this campaign to retake the promised land. And they said, not only will we go with you, we will go first, and we won't go home until, any, until everybody else has their inheritance. And Moshe said, copy that sounds good let's roll and then they started rolling all right <laughs> verse 14 for the tribe of the children of reuben according to the house of their fathers and the tribe of the children of the gad according to the house of their fathers have received their inheritance and the half tribe of manasseh has received its inheritance the two tribes and the half-tribe have received their inheritance beyond the Jordan and of Jericho eastward toward the sunrise. And Yahweh spoke to Moshe, saying, These are the names of the men who divide the land among you as an inheritance. Eliezer the priest and Yehoshua son of Nun, and take one leader. So Yehoshua and Eliezer are the two guys who are in charge of the division of the land here. Um, 
and take one leader of every tribe to divide the land for the inheritance. And these are the names of the men from the tribe of Yehuda of Judah, Caleb, son of Yephuneh. And from the tribe of the children of Shimon, Simeon, Simon, it's all the same name, Shemuel, son of Amihud, from the tribe of Binyamin, Elidad, son of... Weird. If there's anything in the sound of my voice that is not of Yahweh, the Most High Father, I rebuke it in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach and command it to flee. All right. My phone screen for the first time ever just went black and stopped recording in the middle of my words. But it looked like something pressed my screen right in front of my face. I was built for warfare. Let's do this. From the tribe of Binyamin, Elidad, the son of Kislan, and a leader from the tribe of the children of Dan, Buki, son of Yogli. From the sons of Joseph, a leader from the tribe of the children of Manasseh, Haniel, son of Ephod, and a leader from the tribe of the children of Ephraim, Kemuel, son of Shiptan, and a leader from the tribe of the children of Zebulun, Elitzaphan, son of Parnak, and a leader from the tribe of the children of Issachar, Paltiel, son of Azan, and a leader from the tribe of the children of Asher, Ahihud, son of Shalomi, which is like baloney but kosher, and a leader from the tribe of the children of Naphtali, Pedahel, son of Amihud. These are the ones Yahweh commanded to divide the inheritance among the children of Israel and the land of Canaan. So, all that mouthful of Hebrew words, not Jewish words, Hebrew words. And Hebrew is both a language that is spoken and a nation, a people group, which is the descendants of those 12 tribes, which are Israel, because Jacob, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Jacob got renamed Israel, and these 12 tribes are the descendants of his 12 sons. So Israel, as we just saw, is not a bunch of lines on a map. It is these people, their descendants, and those who have been grafted into this tree of life by the atoning sacrifice of Messiah. Just yet again to hit that again and again and again. Now, I think it's also important to state that the nation state of Israel in the Middle East very likely is pivotal to end times. But Israel is much, much more than some lines drawn on a map in 1948. 48? 47? Is it 47? You get my drift. So here in 34, we see that there's some land to be divided up. Uh, Eliezer, the high priest, and Yehoshua, the uh, general, basically, the logistics coordinator. He's Moses part two. Um, so rather than Aaron and Moses, who would have done this, you know, 40 years ago, uh, we've got Yehoshua, Joshua, and uh, Eliezer that are now doing this. They're meeting with the leaders of these tribes, and they're going to disperse this land per uh, by lot. Basically, they're drawing straws for the land. Verse 35, And Yahweh spoke to Moshe in the desert plains of Moab, where the jeeps come from, by the Jordan of Jericho, saying, Command the children of Israel that they shall... Give the Levites cities to dwell in from the inheritance of their possession. Also give the Levites open land around the cities. 
They shall have cities to dwell in for their and open land for their cattle and for their herds and for all their livestock. And the open land of the cities which you give to the Levites are from the wall of the city around a thousand cubits all around. Why do the Levites need cities? Well, the Levites are in service to what? The tabernacle, the tent of appointment. They are in charge of the animal sacrifice, ritual sacrifice, which we no longer do because Yeshua was our atoning sacrifice. That part of this Old Testament has been fulfilled. Um, so the sin offering, the ascending offering, um, you know, the taking of vows, all of that. The Levites do. They need a place to live. And they need land around the cities for their cattle and for their herds and for all their livestock because they spend a lot of time with livestock, uh, especially slaughtering livestock. And you shall measure outside the city on the east side 2,000 cubits, the south side 2,000 cubits, the west side 2,000 cubits, the north side 2,000 cubits, and the city in the middle. This is to them the open land for the cities. So, if you think about it, from the middle of the city, 2,000, uh, it says from the middle, and the city is in the middle. Measure outside the city on the east side. So, there's a 2,000 cubit standoff. That's about 3,000 feet. So, 3,000 foot standoff from the city walls. That is the open space. But from the walls is 1,000 cubits. That space is given for flocks and herds. So, there's a 1,500 foot strip got this and do I have a thing to write on whatever I have a hand there we go so in the middle you'll notice the city then this area around here that's for livestock this area here is open, okay? So from the city to the edge of the area for the livestock is 1,000 cubits, 1,500 feet-ish. Then beyond that is another open space of 1,500 foot. Why is that? Well, number one, you're gonna need room for expansion, but number two, it's a strategic feature. You want open space in between you and your enemy if you get attacked because distance equals time. It gives you more time to react. You can see somebody coming. Um, you don't want, you know, the cedars of Lebanon, however many meters tall, right on your doorstep because people can use those as cover to get up right to you. So they have this offset around the city, um, I think both for future expansion, but also uh, for strategic reasons. And the city which you give to the Levites, cities, are the six cities of refuge which you give to the manslayer to flee to, and to these you add 42 cities. All the cities which you give to the Levites are 48 these with their open land. And the cities which you give are from the possession of the children of Israel. From the larger tribe you give many, from the smaller you give few. Each one gives some of its cities to the Levites in proportion to the inheritance that each inherits. So let's stop there for a minute and go back to, and the cities which you give to the Levites are the six cities of refuge which you give to the manslayer to flee to and to those you had 42 cities. Flip over to Exodus 21, 12. There's a lot going on in this area of Exodus. Exodus 20 is kind of, uh, kind of important to everybody ever, all the time. Uh, this is page 79 in the scriptures. Exodus 21, 12. And he, and if he does, oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> he who strikes a man so that he dies shall certainly be put to death. 
But if he did not lie in wait, but Elohim delivered him into his hand, then I shall appoint for you a place where is he is to flee. <sighs> Cities of refuge. So we're talking about manslaughter here. Not premeditated murder. Manslaughter. A city of refuge. <sighs> Why? Why do we have these cities of refuge? Well, there was provision made for lesser acts of violence, meaning that some, some transgressions deserve punishment, but they don't deserve death. Think about it. If it's manslaughter, if you were just driving home and somebody pulled out in front of you real quick and before you could get on the brakes, you hit them. And for whatever reason, you killed them. And you were stone cold sober. It was the middle of the day. There were no weather conditions. It was just an accident. And we can argue, you know, the father's hand in it isn't an accident or isn't it? All right, well, in a court of law, the hand of the Most High Yahweh is very, very rarely respected as an argument. Um, but that's manslaughter. You didn't intentionally kill that person. So, are we now going to kill you? Because we can see here in the Torah, there's a lot of... Uh, he who strikes a man so that he dies shall certainly be put to death. He who strikes his father or his mother shall certainly be put to death. And he who kidnaps a man and sells him, or if he is found in his hand, shall certainly be put to death. And he who curses his father or his mother shall certainly be put to death. And when men strive together and one strikes the other with a stone or with his fist, he does not die but is confined to his bed. If he rises again and walks about outside with his staff, then he who struck him shall be innocent. He only pays for the lost time and sees to it that he is completely healed. And when a man strikes his male or female servant with a rod so that he dies under his hand, he shall certainly be punished. But if he remains alive a day or two, he is not punished. So there's degrees here besides putting you to death. And part of that is these cities of refuge over here in Numbers 35. So, and you can go considerably deeper on that stuff if you just let your fingers do the walking. <sighs> Excuse me, need more coffee. Okay, verse 9. And Yahweh spoke to Moshe, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, when you pass over the Jordan into the land of Canaan, then you shall choose cities to be cities of refuge for you, that the manslayer who struck someone mistakenly shall flee there. Why? Why are these? They're for the manslayer who struck somebody mistakenly. And they shall be cities of refuge for you from the revenger, and the manslayer is not to die until he stands before the congregation for right ruling. So there's an opportunity for a trial here. This Torah is ridiculous. The burden of this law. Oh my gosh. I love it when people are like, you're under the law of sin and death. It's like, first of all, learn to read your Bible. Second of all, um, you as an American-ish, pick your poison. You as an inhabitant of Earth right now, but you as an American are subjected to approximately 4 million laws right now. I'm subjected to about 300. And I know what they are, and I have them available to me as a reference all the time. And um, I'm told by my Messiah that 
his burden is easy, his yoke is light. Now that's a double-edged sword. Imagine that, because what's sticking out of his mouth in Revelation when he comes back? A double-edged sword, which is what? The truth. The truth is, there is a burden. There is a yoke. We focus, as Christians, focus so much on the, I'm free. I've been, you know, I'm free of my sin. Copy. Act like it. Every time Yeshua heals somebody, he says, go forth and sin no more. Shall we sin all the more so that grace may abound? No. God forbid. So, this double-edged, my burden is easy, my yoke is light. Yeah. But the implication is, there's a burden. There's a yoke. There is somebody that you are supposed to walk with. Mm, think about that. And it is light. You think about 300 versus 4 million. That's quite a disparity. And really, when Yeshua rails against the Pharisees, the scribes, the Sadducees, the high priests, it's because they continue to add to his father's perfect law. And they made, you know, they are getting on to him about ritual hand washing and for, you know, eating grain heads, seed heads, while walking through the field on the Sabbath and calling that work. And I mean, point being, what Yeshua came to embody and preserve is this perfect law. 300-ish or so of the 613 Old Testament commandments that we can still keep, that we do still keep. Not 4 million laws. So, we'll get back into Numbers 35. 12, and they shall be cities of refuge for you from the revenger and the manslayer is not to die until he stands before the congregation for right ruling. And of the cities which you give, six are to be cities of refuge. Give three cities beyond the Jordan and three cities in the land of Canaan as cities of refuge. So there's three cities on either side of the Jordan River. These six cities are for refuge for the children of Israel and for the sojourner and for the settler in their midst, for anyone who mistakenly strikes someone to flee there. But if he has stricken him with an instrument of iron so that he dies, he is a murderer. The murderer shall certainly be put to death. And if he has stricken him with a stone in the hand by which one could die and he does die, he is a murderer. The murderer shall certainly be put to death. Or if he has stricken him with a wooden instrument that could kill, and he does die, he is a murderer. The murderer shall certainly be put to death. See, so they make provision here for a trial, for right ruling, and for refuge for those that mistakenly kill somebody for manslaughter. But then there's even more instruction here that says, look, if you smack a dude with a rod of iron, you're a murderer. You're going to die. If you hit somebody with a rock that there's a reasonable expectation that they could die, and he does die, you're a murderer. <clears throat> or if you hit somebody with a wooden instrument that could kill someone, and they do die, you're a murderer. And so there's that puts it back on the person accused of the crime here, saying, look, if I hit you with this roll of paper towels... There's not a reasonable expectation that you will die if I beat you with this roll of paper towels. If you do, that's manslaughter. I'm going to go to the city of refuge and go have my right ruling my trial. However, this is different than a two-by-four. If I whoop your A with a two-by-four... Good morning, son. You going to go read your book? No. No? Okay. You're just going to grab your glasses and carry your book around? Got it. That makes sense. Um... If I whoop you with a two by four and you die, there's a reasonable expectation that if I whoop you with a two by four, you're going to die. And if you do, that makes me a murderer. And therefore, the wages of sin transgressing the law. What is sin transgressing the law right here is death. Yeah, see how that works? It's funny how... 
sound bitey, click baity Christianity has become. The wages of sin are death. Yeah, what is sin? Well, I don't know, brother. It's falling short of the mark. Actually, brother, it's transgressing the law. No, nah, that's just the Torah stuff you say. No, nah, that's what John said. You should go read 1 John verse, chapter 3, verse 4. He who transgresses the law commits sin, and sin is lawlessness. So, knowing that, if you are lawless and beat somebody about the head and face and neck with a two-by-four and they die, guess what the wages of your lawlessness are? They are death, literally. And see, when we say the law has been nailed to the cross, that is such a misnomer. The wages of your sin, your chirographon, the Greek word there is chirographon, your punishment under the law is what was nailed to the cross with Yeshua. One time. Now, people say, well, listen, God is omnipresent. He sees all things. Agreed. Agreed. Uh, and he can work forward and backward in time. Agreed. And that the atoning sacrifice of Yeshua has already bought and paid for all the sins you'll ever commit. Agreed. But are you a manslaughterer or a murderer? Is your city of refuge because you accidentally transgressed the law and will stand in judgment and right ruling? Or are you abusing it and running around murdering the grace of the Most High Yah and His Son Yeshua HaMashiach? You see the difference here? Shall we sin all the more so the grace may abound? No. God forbid, no. What is sin? 1 John 3, 4, transgressing the law. Should we continue to break Torah because of grace, because of Yeshua? No. God forbid. Who said that? The Apostle Paul. It's dangerous when you read your own Bible for yourself. You're dead to me, fly. I will murder you, and I will suffer sin and death if I need to, to wipe you from the face of the earth. <clears throat> All right. So, if you hit somebody with a piece of wood that could kill somebody, and they do die, guess what? You're a murderer, and you'll be treated as such. Verse 19. The revenger of blood himself puts the murderer to death. When he meets him, he puts him to death. Wait a minute. I thought, vengeance is mine, so saith the Lord. Yes, circumstantially. But we've seen before, in fact, here in, in Numbers, uh, what was it, Numbers 31? Right here, Numbers 31. Yahweh spoke to Moshe, saying, Take vengeance for the children of Israel on the Midianites. After that, you were gathered to your people. You're going home after that, Moshe. Yah gives his people, his instruments here on earth, his vengeance. It is his, but he dishes it out. Just like provisions and blessings and grace, he also dishes his vengeance out. We can see right here in Numbers 35, 19, the revenger of blood put himself puts the murderer to death. So if you killed my wife with a two by four, it's not the state that's gonna kill you. It's not the tribe that's gonna kill you. It's me that's gonna kill you. And if you beat my wife to death with a two by four, I'm gonna literally separate your head from your body with my bare hands, just for everybody who is curious. So the revenger of blood himself puts the murderer to death. When he meets him, he puts him to death. <clears throat> and he, if he thrusts him through in hatred or throws an object at him while lying in wait so that he dies or in enmity, he strikes him with his hand so that he dies. The one who struck him shall certainly be put to death for he is a murderer. The revenger of blood puts the murderer to death when he meets him. When he meets him. But if he pushes him suddenly without enmity or throws an object at him without lying in wait, throws an object at him without lying in wait. 
throws an object at him without lying in wait. Think about that. Or uses a stone by which a man could die, throwing at him without seeing him so that he dies, while he was not his enemy or seeking harm. Then the congregation shall judge between him who struck someone and the revenger of blood according to these right rulings. So this here is saying that if the revenger of blood puts the murderer to death, when he meets him, he puts him to death. And if he thrusts him through with hatred or throws an object at him while lying in wait so that he dies, or in enmity he strikes him with his hand so that he dies, the one who struck him shall certainly be put to death, for he is a murderer. The revenger of blood puts a murderer to death when they meet him. So this is all some clarification on what are the things that will get you put to death by the avenger, revenger of blood. You cut somebody with your sword in hatred or throw an object at them, ambush them so that they die. Or strike somebody with hatred, with enmity in your heart so that they die. You will be put to death. Conversely, if somebody pushes somebody suddenly without hatred or throws an object at him without laying in wait or uses a stone by which a man could die, throwing it at him without seeing him, meaning if he throws a rock, but it accidentally hits somebody in the head and they die, while he is not his enemy or seeking harm, then the congregation shall judge between him who struck someone and the revenger of blood according to these right rulings. In these instances where it's not intentional, because remember what Yeshua taught us, Murder is a crime of the heart. That's why he says, you've heard from the words of Moshe, these right here, uh, that you should not murder. Yeah, but he says that you who call your brother an idiot, Raka, have murdered him with your words because murder is a crime of the heart. And so here, the revenger of blood, whether or not you will be killed by that person's blood relative, is based around the intent of your heart. Did you mean to do this? Or was it legitimately an accident? And that is determined by the congregation. Verse 24, Then the congregation shall judge between him who struck someone and the revenger of blood, according to these right rulings. And the congregation shall rescue the manslayer from the hand of the revenger of blood. And the congregation shall return him to the city of refuge where he had fled, and he shall remain there until the death of the high priest who was anointed with the set-apart oil. So for a period of time, he, they stay in that city of refuge until the high priest dies. But if the manslayer at any time goes outside the limits of the city of refuge where he fled, and the revenger of blood finds him outside the city limits of refuge, and the revenger of blood executes the manslayer, he is not guilty of blood. So if the man, the guy who committed manslaughter leaves the city of refuge and the people who want to kill him see him outside of the city of refuge, they can. And they are not guilty of murder. Because, verse 28, he should have remained in his city of refuge until the death of the high priest. But after the death of the high priest, the manslayer is to return to the land of his possession. And these shall be for a law of right ruling to you throughout your generations and all your dwellings. Whoever strikes a being, the murderer shall be executed by the mouth of the witnesses. But one witness does not bear witness against someone to die. And to take no ransom for the life of a murderer who is guilty of death, but he shall certainly be put to death. Flip to Deuteronomy 19.15. Just because the congruency of Scripture, the more of it you read, you know, and see, in part, faith is not understanding, but reading with expectation anyway. Because so many people are like, it just doesn't make any sense. The Bible just doesn't make any sense. Cool. File away those things that don't make any sense and come back around to them. And I guarantee you, you spend enough time in this Bible, that it all starts to make sense. You'll come back to the things that you didn't understand because you've gotten more clarification. You have more data to work with. 
Okay, Numbers 19, 15, page 207 in the scriptures. One witness does not rise up against a man concerning any crookedness or any sin that he commits. At the mouth of two witnesses or at the mouth of three witnesses, a matter is established. In the mouths of two or three, everything is established. And in fact, you know, a lot of people would say, well, that Paul said that. Paul did say that. Do you know why Paul said that? Was it Corinthians? One of them there, Corinthians? Paul said that? Because Paul's job was to study the Torah. Paul knew the Torah. He may, see, without getting too deep into the life of Paul, he may have had his own scrolls of Torah. Um, the Tanakh, the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, the books of Moshe, Moses. That's possible, but it's almost a foregone conclusion that he had the key parts memorized because that's what they did. They memorized him. And so a lot of the stuff that seems like these great, you know, insights that Paul has, and he's just espousing truth, brother. Yeah, where did it come from? It's the Torah. When they say all scripture is profitable, what scripture are they talking about? There was no New Testament. Those were letters that were being passed around. That wasn't a New Testament. That wasn't scripture. They were talking about the Torah and the prophets. And in fact, in Acts 24, 14, Paul when he's being interrogated by the Yehudim, the Jews, which are just one of the 12 tribes of Israel. But when he's being interrogated, they said, what the hell is up, Saul of Tarsus? And he's like, look, guys, it's me, it's Saul. They're like, what are you doing? They're like, well, by the way, I'm going by Paul now. And uh, I found Messiah, and I believe firmly, this is Paul, I believe firmly in the Torah the prophets, and the resurrection. Man, and that's me in a nutshell. Acts 24, 14 right there. But all of this is Torah. The apostles were teaching and living Torah. Yeshua was teaching and living Torah. And to use one of my favorite analogies again, I love it when people who have only read one quarter, maybe, read one quarter of the instruction manual take issue with people who operate the machinery that the instruction manual was intended for every day they've never operated it before they've only read a quarter of the instruction manual and they don't understand that the instruction manual was translated from a different document in a different language they've never gone any deeper than that and uh, they don't know how to operate the equipment Yet they take issue with people who operate the equipment all day, every day, in perpetuity. Not only that, who read the instruction manual, all of it, daily. So, that's fine. That's fine. And so, you can receive those comments, I can receive those comments, but consider the source. Always, with Intel, consider the source. Where is that coming from? As I've said before, practitionership matters. Yeshua lived this Torah. Paul lived this Torah. The disciples lived this Torah. Jacob, John, you know, um, Peter, they lived this. They did this. James, who is Jacob, they, they pff, faith without works is dead. You say you have faith, I'll show you my faith by my works. Right? That's James. Yeah. And Christians will say, well, that's a works-based theology. You're damn right it is. Go to the book of Matthew. Go to Matthew 7, 21 right now. Not everyone who says to me, Master, Master, shall inherit the reign of the heavens. Why? And then he goes on to the parable of, you know, the rock and the sand. And he says, these, those who hear my words and do them shall be like he who built his house upon the rock. 
that's straight from the mouth of Jesus, from Yeshua, and do them. James, Yeshua's brother, Jacob, be not just hearers of the word, but doers also. So we shouldn't be amazed. We should pay attention. We should understand the gravity of the situation when we find the Torah popping up in all the instruction in the New Testament. But we shouldn't be amazed by it because this is what these guys did. So, Numbers 35, verse 31. And take no ransom for the life of a murderer who is guilty of death, but he shall certainly be put to death. So, if you receive the death penalty, you're going to die. There's no ransom. Another thing we get wrong in today's modern society Even when we do have the intestinal fortitude to kill people who truly deserve to be killed, um, man, it'll take 20 years. And there's people, there's Christians, I know many who are like, man, I'm not down with the death penalty. Well, I can see that argument because the courts really are skewed these days if you bring somebody before the congregation verse 24 then the congregation shall judge between him who struck someone and the revenger of blood according to these right rulings according to which rules these the torah not you know us 16 code 32 diet dash four or whatever um but yeah right here in the Torah, there's a provision both for the both for manslaughter and the pardoning of death for that, and for the killing of murderers for the death penalty. And take no ransom for him who has fled to his city of refuge to return to dwell in the land before the death of the priest. So if you leave as a manslayer and go back to where you were dwelling, there's no ransom for you you can be killed. And do not profane the land where you are, for blood profanes the land, and the land is not pardoned for the blood that is shed on it, except by the blood of him who shed it. And do not defile the land which you inhabit, in the midst of which I dwell, for I am Yahweh, for I, Yahweh, am dwelling in the midst of the children of Israel. That right there, if we were going to get into soundbite Christianity, die. Die fly, which is German for the fly. Um, and do not defile the land which you inhabit in the midst of which I dwell. For I, Yahweh, am dwelling in the midst of the children of Israel. That right there could be purely instructional for us right now. Guess what, child of Israel? You, me, all of us. Do not defile the land which you inhabit. Copy. Because Yah is in our midst. Copy. We should remember that. Got it. So, in verse 33, do not profane the land. This is blood for blood. Do not profane the land where you are, for blood profanes the land, and the land is not pardoned for the blood that is shed on it, except by the blood of him who shed it. Blood is a big deal with Yah. Um, boy, there's a rabbit hole I could go down here. But... There has been a war forever since Genesis, early Genesis, Genesis 6, between Yah's people 
and corrupted flesh. Noah was the only one found righteous in his generations. He was the only one of uncorrupted flesh. Noah, his wife, and his three sons. Now, a week before they get on the ark, roughly, Noah chooses wives for his three sons. So how do we get Nephilim, the Nephilim and the giants, before the flood and after the flood, when the flood came to wipe out all corrupted flesh? Well, it's possible, probable, that one of those three wives had corrupted flesh as well. And when they're born, or when their children are born, you get a reemergence of Nephilim. One theory. The cleanliness of that blood. The Father's constantly talking about it. Nations and blood and his people, his chosen people. And I do not believe that the Father's chosen people have a specific skin color or maxiofacial makeup or whatever. But I do believe that there are those who are corrupted and those who aren't. And I do believe that those who are corrupted can be saved through the atoning sacrifice, the blood of Messiah. And I do believe that Matthew 24, at the return of the son of Adam, Yeshua, it will be like unto the days of Noah. There will be corrupted flesh again. And this blood, constantly the Father tells us not to partake of blood. We don't drink blood. We don't play with blood. We don't eat animals that have been strangled. We don't um, partake of the blood of animals that have had their throats slit in pagan worship because there's corrupted flesh and then there's us. And this profaning the land with blood. And that land is not pardoned for the blood that shed on it, except by the blood of him who shed it. Do not profane the land with this blood. This, let's say that you were in the land and you set up your pagan altar and you were slaughtering to somebody other than Yahweh, because that's the Levite's job anyway. You're partaking of this blood. You're profaning the land. The only way to pay for that profanity is the blood of he who shed the blood. It put you to death for doing it. Blood for blood. There's a thread throughout this Bible of this corrupted flesh. And it goes from Genesis all the way to Revelation and Yeshua, behold, I am making all things new. Mm -hmm. This corruption, this world that rails against us, that we're told to not be a part of, come out of her, my people, lest you partake of her sins and plagues, her lawlessness and her plagues. Get the hell out. Be separate, be set apart. Sanctified literally means set apart. Holy means set apart. It means sanctified. Get the hell out. Be set apart from this. Do not be corrupted. Do not be profaning the land where you are. And do not defile the land which you inhabit. Do not make it like where you came from. In the midst of which I dwell, for I am Yahweh. I'm dwelling in the midst of the children of Israel. And that's Numbers 35. And we've already talked about my takeaways from these chapters as we were reading them. So I hope that uh, you found this beneficial, encouraging, edifying. And as always, I'm interested in your productive comments. You know, and I guess one with this, I get many comments from people who are like, yeah, Bear, but what about this verse? I can't believe you keep Torah because of this. Well, if you want to argue, this is not the place for you. If you've watched through the last 50 plus minutes of this video to this point, I would encourage you to watch 
uh, the YouTube video that I did. Just put in Bear Independent Walking in Torah in the search bar and you'll find it. And there's a really good explanation, I think, there of what we do and why and what that looks like for us. So if you want to learn, go watch the Walking in Torah video. If you want to argue, go take a long walk off a short pier. Because if you think a YouTube comment is going to outweigh the conviction of my heart as put there by the Ruach HaKodesh sent straight from Father Yah, you're sadly mistaken. Shalom and blessings, y'all.